Good. Okay, I mentioned before that Dr. Maniades had actually four faculty positions. He, went, he was at Harvard, then Cold Spring Harbor, then Caltech, and then Columbia. But what very few people know is that he had to leave, actually, his first faculty position from Harvard because there was a moratorium on the experiments he wanted to do, namely recombinant DNA uh, experiments. And there was also a very enlightened, quote, mayor at Cambridge at the time who was very much against uh, doing these modern experiments in terms of recombinant DNA technology. So this is something which I think we should be aware of, and we have something similar going on right now with this, quote, um, gain-of-function experiments in virology. And again, there I think uh, enlightened uh, politicians are not the greatest help. Uh, uh, Dr. Maniales is also distinguished in having been chairman of biochemistry at Harvard as well as at Columbia, I think a position he recently relinquished, just to take on some other positions, such as the scientific director and CEO of the Genome Center in New York. Uh, he is still a professor of biochemistry at Columbia, and also he is a member of the Zuckerman Mind Brain Behavior Institute. So, what is his science? He started out really making a major impact by studying the cluster of the human beta globin genes, very important work, and then very molecular, very uh, mechanistic, how RNA transcription works, how NF-kappa-B pathways work, uh, how uh, splicing works, all very, very important uh, work. In the last 10 years, he has, however, it's not a however, he has uh, sort of taken on additional uh, interests, and they have to do with the single cell diversity in brain wiring. And unfortunately, this direction was precipitated by the very uh, unfortunate death of his sister, who died of ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And that has pushed Dr. Maniades into this completely new direction of uh, work, so he's now really a neurobiologist. Uh, he is very much interested in understanding the disease mechanisms of ALS, but also uh, on a very molecular level, he is interested in the structure and function of uh, these new uh, protocadherin uh, proteins, which are fascinating in terms of almost uh, as much uh, variability as uh, uh, immune genes, and that's what he's studying right now, which brings him uh, into understanding a lot of neurological diseases, including autism. Dr. Maniades. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, yes, I, uh, I had to leave Cambridge, uh, and I went to Cold Spring Harbor, where Jim Watson uh, gave me a place to work, and that's where we did the first cDNA cloning. And, uh, and then there was no space at Cold Spring Harbor, so I moved to Caltech and then back. But so I, the, it was a it was a strange time in Cambridge, in which speaking of politics and science, that was a, a major thing. So I'm going to talk about work today that has not led to any drug or any cure, uh, and it's meant to indicate uh, the great complexity uh, of the diseases that uh, I'll refer to. Uh, in, uh, that is to neuropsychiatric uh, diseases. Uh, and I, th I think that uh, the purpose of my talk is to uh, indicate how much complexity has to be uh, unwound uh, before we can actually think in a very specific and creative way about drugs. So uh, this slide uh, shows uh, a beautiful image of the human brain, uh, which has 100 billion neurons. And a key element in both uh, biology and disease is understanding how these circuits are formed, how the neural circuits are assembled during development. And uh, that's obviously a major field. A lot of people are working on this. And understanding these things is really fundamental ultimately to uh, developing uh, treatments and cures for, uh, uh, for these neuropsychiatric diseases. 
So this story started almost 20 years ago um, when uh, a postdoc in my lab uh, by the name of Chong Wu uh, got interested in a gene cluster uh, at, that we uh, later named uh, the protocant here in gene cluster. And uh, this was before the genome, uh, human genome had been sequenced. Uh, we actually pieced this together with bits and pieces of DNA that were being laid down in the database as the human genome uh, was being sequenced. And somehow we pieced it together, and when it uh, emerged, it was breathtaking. This is a architectural masterpiece. What you can see here is that uh, the uh, gene cluster con contains 60 genes. Uh, these are the red ones for alpha, the green ones for beta, uh, these uh, two colors of blues for gamma. And each one of these uh, genes encodes a uh, clustered protocadherin, which is a cell surface molecule uh, that I'll describe in, in much greater detail later. But what's interesting about this is that uh, we quickly realized that there is a mechanism by which uh, random choices could be made in different combinations for expression for these genes. And this shows uh, this point here. What you see is that uh, the stochastic promoter choice, one of these promoters is chosen. Uh, they all contain an active promoter. Uh, it's activated. Uh, it then makes this long uh, pre-messenger RNA transcript which is spliced to give uh, the messenger RNA, which encodes this protein, which has uh, six of these extracellular domains. Uh, they are cadherin-like domains, transmembrane, and um, intracellular domain. So it was uh, an amazing uh, problem of how to sort out how this is done uh, and what it actually does. Now, uh, I need to just uh, point out a couple uh, simple mechanisms that were really discovered uh, in the 1970s uh, by Gunther Stent, and uh, that has to do with how individual neurons see each other. And so the first phenomenon, uh, as it's indicated here, is neurite self-avoidance, where these sister dendrites of individual neurons recognize each other to avoid projecting into the same uh, territory, crossing over, and clumping. So self-avoidance between neurites from the same neuron uh, repel each other. As you can see here, this is a diagram of starburst amacrine cells of the mammalian retina. And you can see that the, uh, that the neurites uh, from this cell uh, uh, make a star-shaped form. They don't uh, clump. They don't uh, touch each other. And that's because uh, each of these neurites has the ability to recognize self from non-self. Uh, and uh, so this is, uh, this is a phenomenon that's very old and was really uh, not well understood. And uh, what uh, was discovered was that the, these protocadherins uh, actually are on the cell surface, and they allow neurites from the same neuron to distinguish between each other. And so, as you can see here, the idea is that uh, if you have perfect match because it's the same cell, uh, they uh, engage in homophilic interaction, and this by a mechanism that's not understood at all leads to repulsion. So these are molecules that look like adhesive proteins, but when they come together, they trigger an intracellular response that leads to repulsion between the neurites. So these, uh, as it says here, homophilic interactions between distinct protein isoforms result in uh, repulsion between neurites. And so the lack of interactions leads to crossover and clumping. Now, there's another phenomenon that's equally important, and that's called tiling. And tiling is where if you have two, two neurons of the same type and they're projecting into a receptive field, they avoid each other because it'll get tangled and, uh, and it'll uh, obviously be difficult to uh, form a circuit. And so this is the normal situation uh, that you see here between two neurons of the same type. And if there is a defect in this process, you see intermingling uh, of, the, uh, of the neurites uh, and this leads to clumping and uh, phys uh, physiological effects. 
So uh, this, when, when we uh, reported this gene cluster, we began to try to understand how it's, it's expressed, but also to begin functional studies. And this was the, the first indication, uh, obviously over a decade after they were discovered, in a collaboration between my lab and uh, Josh Sain's lab at, uh, at Harvard. And so what you see here is uh, one of these starburst endocrine cells in the retina, this beautiful star-shaped uh, neurites. Uh, and this is what happens if you have a conditional uh, proticadherin gamma cluster knockout. So it's knocking out one of the clusters, and you can see this amazing change in which now all the neurites are clumping uh, and uh, because uh, this cell cannot recognize self. So we went on to uh, do uh, a whole series of experiments in mice in which we knocked out individual gene clusters, the alpha, the beta, or the gamma. Uh, and actually it was very complicated because uh, in the middle here is a set of essential genes uh, which if deleted uh, are lethal. And so we had to generate mice that had a uh, back on it that, uh, hold, that carries all these genes that then complements uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the deletions within, within these strains. So I'm going to talk about the, the first uh, example of uh, what these genes do in terms of olfactory sensory neurons. So as uh, most of you know, uh, the olfactory neurons are uh, present in the epithelium of the nose. Uh, and they project in very specific ways based on the receptor they choose, work, work that Richard Axel uh, received the Nobel Prize for. Uh, they extend into the glomerulus where they make, uh, uh, sorry, into the olfactory bulb where they make glomeruli of the same type of neurons. So obviously this is a very complicated wiring process. Um, now, what we uh, knew, actually some work from Yagi's lab uh, in the uh, early uh, 2000s, was that uh, these, uh, these proticadherin genes are expressed uh, randomly within individual neurons. So what's uh, shown here is some work from my lab in which we are looking at single cell analysis of the proticadherins, and these uh, are different cells uh, indicated uh, by these neurons here. And you can see that there's random choice of all of these uh, genes generating, if you will, uh, a barcode on the surface of individual cells. So every cell has a different barcode. So what happens if you, uh, if you uh, delete this? So uh, here's, uh, here's a, uh, just a very car simple cartoon. This is the way uh, olfactory sensory neurons project into the bulb to form glomeruli. And you can see this is a cross, cross section through the bulb. And you can see these individual glomeruli uh, beautifully displayed uh, on the surface. So um, what happens uh, if you delete the proticadherin genes? And uh, what we discovered is, is if we delete one cluster at a time, alpha, beta, or gamma, we saw a little effect. Uh, but uh, what we did was then to look at uh, a, a deletion that removes them all. And what you can see here, this is a uh, homozygous normal mouse. Here's a heterozygous uh, full cluster deletion. And here is a de deletion uh, of uh, the entire cluster in, uh, on both chromosomes. And what you can see here is that uh, there's a complete alteration of the, uh, the pattern of, uh, of these neurons on the surface. And in fact, you don't see distinct glomeruli. They no longer form, uh, form this. And if we uh, do in utero single uh, uh, neuron labeling, uh, what we discover that is in the wild type mouse, this is a single olfactory sensory neuron as it projects into the bulb. And you can see it has this very open-handed uh, uh, configuration here. And that's due to the self-avoidance uh, between, the, uh, uh, be between the, uh, the neurites of the, of the olfactory sensory neuron. However, in the mutant, uh, the full cluster knockout, you can see that it is completely clumped. So it's like the, the, uh, the starburst amacrine cell 
uh, but uh, in this case, uh, we're looking uh, at exonal self-avoidance. How about tiling? <clears throat> well, it, it turns out that if you delete another cluster, uh, uh, it's the protocate here in alpha, uh, you see a tiling defect. And this was actually, uh, this phenotype was first uh, reported by the Yagi lab, and we looked at this more deeply with all three deletions. And this is uh, how it looks in the hippocampus. You see serotonergic neurons that project uh, into the rest of the brain uh, in this beautiful pattern. And this is a wild-type mouse uh, where the, uh, where the uh, serotonergic neurons are labeled. You can see more or less random distribution of these uh, axons within the mouse brain. However, in the, uh, uh, in the knockout, and this, these are knockouts that are specific for serotonergic neurons, you can see a dramatic change. Instead of seeing this random distribution of the serotonergic neurons within the brain, you see it clustering within uh, one part of the hippocampus. And you can look throughout the brain and see a, a very sim a similar disorganization. And by doing single, uh, single neuron uh, labeling and, uh, and more deep uh, visualization, we can show that, indeed, this is a tiling defect. Now, what was interesting from this is that we thought it would, this requires diversity, uh, but it doesn't. So this is what happens uh, if you delete the so here's the normal, uh, the, deleting the entire beta cluster, you see no phenotype. You delete the entire gamma cluster, no phenotype. Uh, the alpha cluster, uh, the, uh, if you just uh, delete uh, the genes up here, no phenotype. And only when you delete uh, these uh, two genes here, in fact, we've uh, not on this slide, as we've shown that the phenotype is due to only one gene, this protocate here. In, uh, uh, AC2, which you'll see the significance of later. So there are two types of genes within the cluster, those that are involved in tiling, those that are involved in, um, in self-avoidance. Uh, the tiling are regulated in a cell-specific way, and uh, the other ones, uh, the, uh, the ones that are required for self-avoidance are uh, stochastically expressed. So um, how is a, the diversity generated? And, We've done a great deal of work on this, and uh, I'm going to give you only a, uh, the conclusions. Uh, the work has been published over several years, and uh, most particularly in, in a recent bioarchive report, we show uh, our, our latest results. So uh, what happens in, in this amazing system is that there's an enhancer element, a transcriptional enhancer element that lies 350,000 nucleotides away uh, from the genes it regulates. And what we've shown through extensive uh, chromatin studies, uh, CTCF cohesin binding, that uh, the way the choice is made is that uh, this enhancer loops over 350,000 uh, nucleotides and randomly chooses one of these genes. And it forms a complex like this. So let's say it activates alpha-4. Uh, there are two CTCF binding sites, uh, in the, one in the promoter and one in the exon, and two in the enhancer, and they, they bind and through cohesin are paired. And this is a, a very specific and actually epigenetically stable uh, phenomenon. That is to say, in, uh, in uh, neoblastoma cells uh, that have made the choice, uh, they propagate that choice, which is pretty amazing. That after this, after this uh, looping occurs, uh, it's maintained through uh, division. How does it work? Uh, well, this is the results of extensive studies within the bioarchive uh, paper, and what we've shown is that in the uh, CTCF site within the exon, there lies a uh, a promoter. And this promoter is activated and uh, generates a high molecular weight antisense link RNA. And as it passes through the upstream promoter, it demethylates the promoter. So all these promoters are highly methylated prior to their choice. And there's a random uh, uh, activation of, of uh, this promoter. It reads through. You can follow both CTCF binding and the demethylation of the promoter 
to give rise to the uh, sense strand RNA that encodes a protein. And as I said, that once this happens, um, you, can, you can see that uh, it's, it's stable. We've, be, we've been able to sh uh, study this whole process within uh, olfactory sensory neurons in the, in the mouse, and we can show that in the epithelial stem cells, uh, they're all, the, all the genes are methylated, uh, none of them are active, uh, but in the next cell gener generation in the differentiation of olf olfactory sensory neurons, you see that the choice is made and, the, and uh, it's stable. And so you see the de demethylation of the, of the active promoter. So what emerges is the two chromosomes then form an extraordinary uh, uh, structure within the nucleus where all of the genes that are off are highly methylated and not part of this transcriptional activation complex, whereas the, the genes that are randomly chosen are, are present and active, and they interact with uh, specific uh, protein interactions. So, uh, so that's how the code is generated, and uh, this happens independently in, a, in every cell. And uh, you, you may, why, you, you may guess that why should 60 genes allow you to generate a barcode that's deeply complex enough to do this? And the answer uh, actually lies within the protein, which has uh, been a wonderful collaboration uh, between my lab and the laboratories of, uh, of Larry Shapiro and Barry Honig. So how is the code read at the cell surface? Well. Uh, here's, the, here's the typical situation. So you have these random sets of genes are activated, uh, and uh, if they're expressing the same uh, cells, uh, I mean the same set of protocadherins, uh, they engage in homophilic interactions, and this results in repulsion. And so this is matched sister neurites, and this would be unmatched. Now this is, this is uh, uh, drawn uh, as a... Uh, as a model, this, this is actually a slide of about four years old, and I'm going to show you that this model is actually correct. And the model was established through really atomic resolution, X-ray crystallography, as well as uh, X-ray tomography. So uh, a long story short, this is actually how they look. Uh, so this is the two cell membranes. Uh, these are the uh, individual uh, protocadherins. They form random cis dimers alpha, beta, beta, alpha, all possible combinations. And that's where you generate uh, an enormous amount of diversity. And so as you can see here, the different colors are meant to be uh, different protocadherins. And we proposed, based on the fact that these molecules interact in an uh, unusual way, uh, that is in a anti-parallel fashion, that uh, the cis dimers would be able to find their partners on the opposing membrane and, uh, and that would allow then the formation of a cis-trans tetramer, uh, which would then form this lattice. And the idea is that the lattice is important. And we did experiments I won't go into uh, now, but we were able to show that if you take cells and culture to study this, at, at least the, uh, the adherence part, that a single mismatch of a protocadherin prevents uh, interaction. And we didn't understand that. And we now believe that it is due to the fact that you make this lattice. So if you have a perfect match, you make this long lattice that just uh, polymerizes uh, on the cell surface. And if you have a single mismatch, so in this case, you're missing. Uh, so here, here you have a single mismatch between these two cells. Now it forms a very small uh, interaction. Uh, apparently not sufficient uh, for uh, repulsion and self-avoidance. Self so how do we uh, know that that's the case? Uh, the recent experiments uh, by Julia Brash, Alex Nobel, uh, Noble at the uh, Structural Biology uh, Center uh, in New York, uh, and what they did was to take a his-tagged protocadherin gamma B6, put it into liposomes, and then carry out uh, uh, cryo-EM tomography. So you're just taking sections uh, through the sample. And what you can see is you'll see the appearance of this amazing lattice, which you see here. So these are liposomes, and these are the, uh, as you 
scan through them, you can see these beautiful, uh, uh, these uh, beautiful dimers on dimers uh, engaging. So, uh, uh, additional work, uh, it was possible to get a cis-trans uh, uh, tetramer uh, in a crystal, uh, determine uh, that atomic resolution, and then using computational me methods, match the, uh, the images in the uh, cryo-EM uh, with the structure. And basically what you can see is they form, uh, as you can see, between uh, the liposomes, uh, as indicated here and here and that uh, what you see is this uh, beautiful array of random sets of uh, proto-cadherins that, uh, that are engaging across the two cell membranes. So, so the answer to the complexity problem is that by this two mechanisms, one is having, having uh, random uh, cis dimers formed and engage, having very high degree of homophilic uh, uh, specificity and forming these lattices uh, explains how this relatively small set of genes can generate sufficient functional diversity uh, for self-avoidance. So uh, more recently, uh, we began uh, thinking about uh, how this might be involved in neurological diseases. And I should say that uh, the characterization of these uh, proto-cadherent AC2 mice that have uh, the serotonergic neuron tiling uh, difficulties. We looked at very carefully with a broad range of behavioral assays. Uh, these mice display classic depression, uh, classic uh, fear avoidance, uh, sorry, uh, in fear avoidance and other uh, uh, phenotypes that are characteristic of autism. So uh, as you know, uh, Mike Wiggler at Cold Spring Harbor and others, the Simons Foundation has been uh, carrying out deep uh, genetic studies of autism. Uh, it is a major focus of our uh, genetic program at the New York Genome Center. And what has emerged from this is a set of genes that were identified through family studies, through trios and quads, uh, that have a high probability of being uh, functionally uh, significant. And this is just uh, a large number of cell surface uh, gene uh, proteins encoded by genes that uh, come up in that uh, genetic study. And you can see right in the middle there are the cluster proto-cadherins. In fact, uh, if you now look at uh, GWAS studies, uh, this is work that, uh, that was sent to me uh, from, uh, from the Broad. Uh, this is a, a very large GWAS study for proto-cadherin alpha gene cluster. And you can see that at uh, 10 to the minus 8th, uh, you see this uh, very high probability of, uh, of being associated uh, with the disease. And here's the protocadherin alpha locus right here. Uh, same thing is true of bipolar. It's less, this example is less uh, dramatic, but again, a very significant uh, co-occurrence of, uh, of this variant uh, within uh, the protocadherin alpha cluster. And if you look at all the gene lists that, that's on the Simons Foundation webpage, you can see that virtually every uh, protocadherin cluster is represented. And most importantly uh, is this protocadherin alpha C2, which is uh, in the, uh, the gene that I mentioned is required for normal uh, serotonergic wiring. So I think there's no question that there is a relationship between this gene uh, and, uh, and, the, and the disease. Uh, and uh, I should say that um, this is a characteristic of autism, that uh, a large set of genes that, are, uh, that function specifically in neural circuit assembly are, are, are identified. So in some ways it's not, it's not a surprise, but it's uh, amazing for us that uh, all this came together uh, with the molecular studies. So I want to acknowledge the people who uh, did this work uh, I had an incredible group of uh, scientists in my lab, Weixing Shen, uh, uh, did much of the mouse work. Uh, George Montoferis, who's now in David Aver Anderson's lab at Caltech as a, as a postdoc. Uh, Maxime Chevy was a technician. Chiamaka Nokwazi is an MD-PhD student. 
A2 Chan worked out uh, this wonderful model for the uh, interference of proticadherins. Daniele Canzio has done all the work on promoter choice, and Sean O'Keefe is a bioinformatics uh, 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 postdoc. Uh, the Larry Shapiro and Barry Honig's lab uh, were instrumental in the protein part. Rodem Rubenstein, Kerry Goodman were postdocs and then collaborated with Julia Brass, Clint Potter, and Bridget Geriger at the uh, New York Structural Biology Center. And a, uh, the single cell, uh, single nucleotide labeling, sorry, single neuron labeling that I uh, showed before was uh, helped by Yusuke Hirabayashi in uh, Frank Palou's lab. So this is the, uh, the people that uh, worked out this promoter choice uh, problem. I just wanted to point out that uh, the person that really led this was Daniele Canzio, who's a postdoc, who is moving to UCSF as a junior faculty in their new, new neuroscience uh, uh, building uh, in a few months. And uh, uh, the, this work was also done in close collaboration with Stavros Lombardis, who is a uh, faculty member uh, in biochemistry and uh, is one of the leaders in studies of uh, olfactory sensory neuron, uh, olfactory sensory gene expression. I just wanted to uh, bring us back to what we've discussed uh, much, of the, uh, much of this meeting, and that is that we're talking about quality of people, basic science. Uh, these two people were in my lab in the 1990s uh, and uh, in the 1980s. So uh, they announced a few days ago the winners of the two 2019 Breakthrough Prize. Uh, and one of the winners is Dr. James Shen, UT Southwestern Medical School, for the discovery of the C-gas enzyme that launches the body's immune defense against infections and cancer. And when he worked with me, uh, he was instrumental in uh, identifying the role of the ubiquitin proteasome pathway in the activation of, uh, of uh, the I-kappa B kinase and NF-kappa B. He continued this work independently and has just been uh, an extraordinary contributor to, uh, to the field. Uh, Adrian Craner uh, was actually the first graduate student that worked in my lab uh, in the 1980s. He played a central role in discovering the lariat mechanism for splicing. He went on to Cold Spring Harbor where he spent his entire career uh, and he was absolutely central and uh, the discovery and application of the Spinraza uh, through collaborations uh, with industry. And so he received this for his research in a rare neurodegenerative disease and the life-saving medication to treat it. So to me, this provides a really beautiful example of how uh, uh, students, postdocs that are, are really pursuing very basic problems in molecular biology and cell biology uh, can go on and continue this work and, uh, and connect that uh, with drug development in a way that uh, leads to this kind of accomplishment. Thank you. Uh, astrocytes and oligodendrocyte precursor cells also beautifully tile out the brain, and they're also cells of origin for glioblastoma. And in the glioblastoma lines we study, we see that each line has its own fingerprint of protocoterins. So uh, do they play a role in uh, tiling of glial cells? Well, I, I believe they almost certainly do. In fact, they probably are involved in glial neuron interactions, but there's one or two papers on this that are very, uh, I'd say, early. Uh, it's a fundamentally important problem, uh, and uh, there's no question that a lot of the uh, uh, multicellular complexity in the brain is a consequence of these kinds of interactions. And as you probably know, in, uh, in uh, glioblastomas and many other cancers, uh, you see the, the misexpression of protocadherins that leads to that. So uh, one of the protocadherin gamma proteins, it's either C3, 4, or 5, uh, are essentially tumor suppressors, and they show up in liver cancer. They show up uh, in a lot of different uh, uh, cancers. So these genes uh, function not just in, in, uh, in neuro neuronal wiring, but in cell-cell interactions widely, and uh, defects uh, can lead to, uh, in, in this case, to cancer. Tom, 
in terms of your uh, autism studies, so you, you clearly showed that there is uh, some um, genetic cause for autism. Uh, what is the percentage, in your opinion, which is genetically versus environmentally caused? Well, as you know, uh, there are two kinds of genetic variations that have been associated with aut autism, uh, inherited and de novo. And I think uh, most, of the, uh, most of the genetic based autism is, is probably de novo mutations. And as you know, there's a correlation between age of conception uh, and uh, in the occurrence of these de novo mutations. Uh, and so uh, I think that uh, autism, in a way, is right at the uh, edge of trying to understand uh, the function of uh, in intergenic and intronic. Uh, DNA sequence invariants. And so at the Genome Center, uh, what we're doing is we've taken a cohort of about 25,000 family-based uh, 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 cells and have uh, determined uh, both a whole exome and whole uh, genome sequence. And we're beginning to see patterns of relationships of uh, enhancer and intronic mutations uh, uh, and, and, the, and the disease. And so I think, in, in some ways, uh, autism, uh, we believe, will really uh, provide uh, deep insights into this problem that we have to solve, and that is, uh, what, what is the nature of, uh, of these uh, mutations in the uh, intergenic sequences, and what is the complexity of the currents of these? And you know, this is a complex genetic disease. It's not due to a single gene defect. It's sort of the combinatorial nature of all these changes. It's going to be... Uh, obviously an extremely challenging uh, problem, both to determine the genetics of that and, and the function. But uh, I think it illustrates in many ways, as uh, Dr. Sharney was saying earlier on, there's, a, there's a frustration in pharma of uh, coming up with the drugs, and this is part of what's happening. It's a, it's a very complex disease, as is Alzheimer's in a very similar way. So it's a, it's a challenge, but I think we have the tools now and, uh, and the functional assays to begin to understand uh, what these mutations do.